My name is Simon, Simon Karasik. I am a machine learning engineer at Nebio CI. I'm working on large language models at the moment. So Nebio CI is a cloud uh, company where we're making a NAI specific cloud, but there is an RZ team that's working on LLMs and I'm coming from this team. And yes, yeah, that's what I do now. And about coffee, you know, I tried to quit coffee some time ago. I didn't drink coffee for a month. At first it was challenging, but then it became fun. I realized that tea is great. You can have tea with milk, tea without milk, a green tea, black tea. What is happening, MLOps community? We are back for another podcast edition. As per usual, I am your host, Dimitrios. And today we're talking with Simon, but before we get into all of that, I've got a little bone to pick with the Australians out there. For the life of me, I cannot understand why you call lettuce salad. Salad is so much more elaborate than just lettuce. So stop doing it on injustice and make sure if you're going to call something salad, you at least have some dressing or the very least oil and vinegar on that, please. All right, that's it with my bone to pick. Now, we got into a deep, deep conversation with Simon all about checkpoints and checkpoints when it comes to training large language models. As you will hear, he is currently training a 300 billion parameter model, which sounds absurdly large. I'm very excited to see what comes out of that. But he talks about how checkpoints become so big when you are training at that level, the checkpoint management in itself is something that you have to think about and scaling laws for what you're gonna do with these four terabyte checkpoints becomes an issue. And how you look at the management of, oh, do we need one per week? Do we need one per hour? Do we need checkpoints that we had a month ago? How do you manage all of that? He breaks down eloquently. I really appreciated it. And he's got like the coolest job in the world because he's working at Nebulous AI and they are specifically a cloud provider that is dedicated to AI workloads. So what does that mean? Well, that means that they have tools for training and inference. They also have a whole lot of GPU availability, which everybody needs. If you're going to be doing any kind of AI these days, it seems like. And there's also like a UX that's built for the engineer and developers, which is top notch. So you don't have this mess of services. There's not that paradox of choice of which service should I use? They really think through that. And what Simon told us is he's been dog fooding the whole LLM generation process. And as you will see, he got into some of the nitty gritty when it comes to networking checkpointing i feel like an expert after talking to him about checkpointing and as for like a little icing on the cake we could call it he talked about the differences that he has seen over his years between scikit learn models and training those and training a one billion parameter large language model quote unquote large i guess we could call that small language model these days and then training something like this 300 billion parameter large language model. So hope you all enjoy and a huge shout out to Nebius for sponsoring this episode. If you like it and you think it is valuable, we would love to see you leave some feedback in Spotify, drop a star, leave a review. Comments on YouTube are always fun. Subscribe. You know what to do. I'll see you all on the other side or maybe in San Francisco on June 25th for the in-person AI quality conference we're organizing. Whenever I think about checkpoints, I think about Checkpoint Charlie because I love Berlin and I go to Berlin quite a bit. So I have that association. I say the word checkpoint and then next thing that comes up is Charlie. We are going to be talking all about checkpoints today. But before we get into that, I want to talk to you a little bit about how you came to be where you're at. I know you've done some work with traditional ML and you are now training large language models. So I want to hear about the juxtaposition there and like how things differ in that regard. 
but maybe you can talk to us about what you were doing with ads before you started training large language models. Yeah, sure. You know, first of all, I also visited Berlin recently and also yeah. had a cessation with Checkpoint Charlie. And it was one of my ideas to have this like uh, a logo for some presentation. I don't know. But well, it's it. good to find a good image. Yeah, so now we're working with large language models, but before I worked quite a lot in advertisement. In machine learning for advertisement, I worked at Yandex. It's kind of Russian Google. Some people call it like this. And I was focused on ML infrastructure there. And I was making some different ranking systems, like click prediction. Like if you see some bottle uh, without advertised, uh, will the user click on this bottle or will not click? And I was also working on infrastructure because it turned out that infrastructure is really big. Is really complex. It's not just like let's deploy this model. It takes like maybe 20 different steps, different teams, different systems for the model to get trained, to collect the data, to be pushed to production. And it was like, wow. Ouch. Ouch. And we'll break that down a little bit more. You can't just say that and then keep me hanging. <laughs> okay. Why was it so big? What, what did that look like? Paint the picture a little bit more. Because uh, if you want, to create a great advertisement system that is accurate, that is like personalized. You have to collect lots of data and process it. Because it was like, I was making some deep learning model, like some recommender model, and it doesn't just go to production. This model is a feature to another model that is another model. It's like a big combination. And like, okay, well, I need to train this deep learning model in PyTorch, but it's not regular PyTorch. It's like PyTorch, especially for recommender systems. And it has some special add-ons developed by my, my colleagues. Then it comes there, we need to validate. Then we have some data that's coming every hour. But it's not actually real every hour because it takes time for the data to actually come from your click on the online to the data store and then it's getting trained and pushed to production. And it's where lots of lots of pieces like that were developed for years. Mm -hmm. And even like we had this like a service that is serving like 10 or 20 deep learning models for different teams and also was a big big like infrastructure and inference and i remember like i do something you know like i reduce uh some load some save some percentage of cpus like let's remove this model and save like one percentage of cpus but it ends up like saving as 1,000 of CPUs. It was like, wow. And I have never seen the CPUs. I just see this dashboard, like <laughs> that many CPUs we consume, but it's not like whole data center, like 20 computers. I don't know. Uh, but I, did you get a medal or anything? Did you get a raise <laughs> after you did that? What? Yeah. I was, did anyone notice, I guess? Sure. Like... <laughs> Everybody knows because like if you if you release some CPUs, that means now we can use it for something more more useful. But you can't just remove some model from production. It takes time to check that nobody needs this model, like it doesn't make any profit. Then you can remove this model and you use this space for something else. Damn, that's crazy what you just said. How there was basically like dead models out there in the wild still but there wasn't proper cleaning that had happened. So they were still just like hanging out and you recognize that and you were able to save CPU costs and just like open up CPUs for newer things and potentially better things to come out or at least new experiments that are going to be not dead in the wild. And what did the process look like for like that garbage collection? Actually, it was a kind of another project. It was another project that tried to connect all the pieces together because we had this runtime, like inference, then we had some data part, we had training pipelines, and they were not really interconnected. And it happens like maybe you had some model in runtime, you removed this model, but the process that was training this model was still active. It was still consuming some CPUs every day it was another project to actually connect all the pieces together so that if you delete a model from runtime, you get a warning. Hey man, you still train this model. Maybe you should stop it. Wow. 
that is so wild to think about that you had so many models out there and being trained and just being in production that it's almost like people lost count of them or there wasn't like clear owners of it. Is that safe to say? It's some kind of historical reasons, you know, like you have a system that is active for like 10 years or more. Somebody created a model like 10 years ago and deployed it. It, it uh, makes a job, it works well. Eventually the system got refactored, changes, changes, and then you have some line of config that you have no idea how it comes here, who made this model. The person who made this model is already, I don't know, in another company for five years and nobody knows. You want, you don't want to crash the production. So you're really making it step by step. Yeah. I can understand that you're being very cautious about how you go about collecting those models or getting them out of production because is a non-zero chance that it could actually be very valuable and there could be a lot of money being made. And that, then you went and you said, all right, enough of the deep learning recommender systems. I'm going to go to the source. I like large language models now. Or what happened? Give me the breakdown on how you started working with large language models and training large language models. Yeah, it was uh, just an opportunity. I saw this like job. I decided this is really interesting. I see that how large language models are changing the world. I even remember when I was working back in advertisement, my team lead was so much impressed. He said like, no matter what we do, LMs will uh, replace everything. Oh no, he was one of those guys. Yeah, he was kind of fatalist, but still I, it, it was impressive. You know, like when you saw that, like I'm doing this super tough job, nothing can replace me. So then you go to JGPT and say, hey, could you write this code for me? And it does the job. You write, you're writing an article, you like spend it one hour, then you ask ChatGPT and it makes it better. The better than it was made, making for an hour. And no, it's mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah. So that made you realize there's a lot of potential here and what happened? Yes, yeah, so I joined this team and we started making this language models. I was one of the first to join, maybe like my like peeps to join. And what's impressive, what was impressive for me, because you know, back in the days when I worked in ads, it was like a really large team. Like it was people for everything. Like you can talk to this guy, to this guy. And ideally have That's to... How there was a million models in production. Yeah, and I haven't re really had an idea of how it all works at such a big scale. You joined a new team within Yandex that was working on large language models? No, I, I joined Nebius. I joined okay. Nebius. So and now Nebius is working on this uh, LLM project. Okay, and it's a, it, it's a startup, so you don't have someone to get you coffee in the morning and someone to write your reports for you. You got to do everything now on your own. Yeah, sounds like that. So it's like Nebulous is a cloud company. It's most you know cloud cloud development, cloud engineering, but we still have this team of large language models. It's like we are like a small island of machine learning, actually machine learning guys around big infrastructure guys. And like I have to come up with ideas. My team has to come up with idea how can we make this machine learning, big machine learning training like out of bare like cloud services. For sure you have Kubernetes, you have storage, you have some CI, but it's, it's these are building blocks. Uh, when well, you need to do a real big pipeline. Oh, I it see. It was a tough, it, it's an interesting journey. So it's, all, it, it's almost like you're dog fooding the LLM journey that your customers are going on and you're doing it yourself so that when customers say, oh, we want to train a large language model. We want to train a large language model. Then you understand what they're about to go through. Yeah, exactly. So the fooding is one of the terms we're now using. And it's actually now, you know, like we're one step uh, ahead of our customers. So whatever it happens, first we might find some problem. We fix it. 
and we know that now our cloud is 100% production grade because like we train such a big model and we know what can go wrong and what can go well. Yeah. Yeah. And talk to me about the models that you've trained so far. Yeah. So, uh, we started like with a kind of testing. So while we one of our first goal was to verify that we can train a good model. So we tried to reproduce a Llama 7 billion parameters in the way which reproduces data collection pipelines, training pipelines. Uh, we had this kind of budget we limited as Llama and made sure that we can do a good job. And then we decided to go bigger. So now we are trading a 300 billion parameters model. It's like huge. It's still in progress, so I maybe can't share lots of details, but I yep. hope you will hear about it soon. <laughs> it's but it's not like it's like three hundred billion parameters. It's like uh, more than one thousand GPUs to train, just like insane, you know. And I have never seen these GPUs. Like I have never been to data center, but I can imagine you know like a big big room full of computers just doing some matrix multiplications. Yeah, yeah. That's where you can go in the winter if it gets too cold. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That big room with all those GPUs. Wow. So that is impressive. Now, I want to talk about checkpoints and what that experience has been like, like what the learnings you have seen while training have been. I think for the uninitiated, can I give you my understanding of checkpoints and then you can yeah, sure. correct me and tell me where it's wrong? I look at checkpoints like when you're playing video games and you get to a certain part in the game that the next time you die, you go back to that part. So you don't go all the way back to the beginning. You just go back to whatever the level four, or level five, wherever you get to the beginning of level four. And then you face the final boss of level four. But is that a good way of putting it or tell me where I'm I'm off. Yeah, it's you know it's really a good comparison. It's really how it happens. But you know like if if, if the what can happen like you wake up one morning and see like and and your loss plots that your loss has exploded. You know like oh wow, we need to roll back. I hope we have a checkpoint because if you don't have a checkpoint, you're in trouble. You need to redo like days of work but if you have a checkpoint you still have maybe some hours to retrain how often are you checkpointing maybe like once every hour or maybe two hours nice so just to make sure like if something happens like we don't have to kind of redo many steps because on one hand you know like checkpoints is also not free because you want if i want to save checkpoint i still have to freeze the training like for 10 for five minutes maybe for for some minutes to save the checkpoint. So if I do checkpoints too frequently, I make the training slower. But if I don't do checkpoints, I, I'm in the risk. Yeah. Yeah, you're taking a risk. So you found the sweet spot is once an hour, once every two hours? Yeah, it just sounds like it's a reasonable, it's a reasonable amount of time that it's okay. If something happens, maybe we are okay to redo one hour of training. Yeah, and you're checkpointing everything like or how do you calculate the checkpoint size i guess yeah sure so like you know it's quite an impressive because if you have a large language model on hugging face it's like often it's like inference model in a way it is already quantized and just you're ready to push it into, into a gpu and it's like you have a parameter and often it's like like two bytes per parameter and it's like you have Llama 7 billion parameters and like 14, 13 gigabytes. But if you train a model like this, you need much, much more space because you have optimizer, you have parameters. It's like three numbers. Like for every billion you have, you need to have like three billions of numbers to save. And like each number is like a floating point number. It's like four bytes. And it's like, okay, you have Llama, Llama 7 billion on Hugging Face. This is just like 13 gigabytes. But to train Llama, you need to have 70 gigabytes of space. Like 70 or something like that. And it's not all. 
okay, we save 70 gigabytes, but inside, in memory, you have much more. You have like gradients, you have all this kind of stuff when, that are allocated when you train. You don't save it, but it is allocated on GPUs. So if I wanted to train Samsung, it's like, okay, no problem. It's like just 13 gigabytes. No, it's not 13. It's like hundreds of gigabytes that I need to be allocated in GPU memory. And that's presumably why things get very expensive very quickly. Yeah, sure. Because like you need to have lots of just memory <laughs> to allocate the model. Yeah. And you need to have the confidence that you're doing the right thing because I can imagine a lot of fear that people have when they're training models is they're training something and it's going to come out in 20 days or 14 days and it's going to be absolute shit and not very useful. So how are you making sure to cover your back on that? Yeah, sure. So first of all, uh, we start with small experiments. So we start with like 1 billion model, 3 billion model, something that can be trained like in one day, in three days, uh, not on like on 100 GPUs, but maybe on like on 8 or 16 GPUs, just to make sure that we are doing the right job. Because we know there are papers about scaling clothes, about like if you make your model 10 times bigger, what will be the result? So knowing that, we can say, okay, if it's a small model, it's okay. Big model also should be okay. So this is kind of the first way we, we make sure that everything is all right. Also, when we do training, we have a lots of plots we do. We have weights and biases. It's like we have 100 da dashboards there because we have laws, we have gradients, we have gradients on this layer, on that layer. And it really helps because if something goes wrong, we can always uh, go to this particular uh, plot and see what happens there. Mm. Okay. But it feels like there's different types of checkpoints that you can do, right? Like there's basic checkpoints and maybe there's more in-depth checkpoints. Am I off on that one? Actually, I guess there is only one type of checkpoint we can do. So we just save uh, as a model with optimizer state. And basically it is everything we need to have to restore our training. So if something crashed, we still can restore the training from this checkpoint and it will still have all the same uh, loss. It will continue right where it stopped. So when it is a smaller model, like you were talking about, are checkpoints any different? Yeah, so there is a difference and the difference is in size. So if you train a model like 300 billion parameters, its checkpoint is like three and a half terabytes. Just insane. Okay. Like you see, three and a half terabytes. You know, my MacBook has like only 400 yeah, gigabytes. Yeah. Oh my God. It's like more than like the hard drive of my laptop. And it's still, it needs to be saved like every hour, like with many replicas. And it doesn't fit into one uh, computer. Like if you, even if you have this super powerful, a GPU uh, virtual machine, it has one terabyte of uh, memory and ter and checkpoint is three terabytes. So you need to have like several uh, virtual machines to save this uh, checkpoint and to load it. And it's really a lot. So if you have a small model, like relatively small, like one billion parameters, like some years ago, it was <laughs> the highest you can get. <laughs> I remember like when BERT was released, like BERT large was 300 million and was like a lot. Nobody could uh, run it. It was really heavy. And nowadays we don't even count this one. Yeah. We don't even bat an eye. That's so true. Yeah. So yeah, if you have a small checkpoint, it's not a problem to save it. Maybe it's 50 gigabytes, maybe 70. It's still not so much. Like our machines that, that we, on which we run training, are much bigger and you can save 70 gigabytes to disk it will take some time but it's still it's okay it's not a big issue but now when you have terabytes you need to save you need to save you need to do it in parallel you need to distribute a checkpoint uh, uh, among costs among virtual machines because if you 
try to save three terabytes from one uh, virtual machine, it will take really long. Yeah. So we do some hacks to make it faster. Oh yeah? Tell me about those. Yeah, sure. So first of all, we do it in parallel on many machines. We split our checkpoints, so our checkpoint into parts. So if you have training and retrain it on eight uh, machines, each machine will save a part of this checkpoint. So that, yeah, okay, in total it's like three terabytes, but for every machine it's just like like 300 gigabytes. It's still quite a lot, but it's not so much. Yeah. It reminds me of torrents, like when you torrent a, a music file or something and you get it back from many different pieces of that music file. Yeah, kind of something like that, yeah. And uh, we also realized, okay, like we have these machines and we have network to the storage, like, you know, regular internet network. Yeah. And our machines are connected uh, via super fast InfiniBand network. It's like a GPU to GPU network because if you train a model on many machines, you need to communicate a lot. That's why there is a InfiniBand a super fast network. And okay, we have a network between hosts that is much faster than the network to the storage. So when we save our model, our checkpoint, it is saved like a small bits from every uh, from every host. Then we load small bits. So when we load the checkpoint, every host has only a small part of the model. It's not enough. But in total, every host has everything. And then we use our super fast network to exchange the parts. How often are you needing to use the checkpoints? Is it like once a week? Once a day? Yeah, it it depends. You know, if everything goes well, we don't want to ever roll back. Yeah. Ideal world, we have a training. We just uh, start it. We wait one month. So uh, it depends, you know. Uh, uh, actually, we use checkpoints always because on top of what we train, uh, we have another background uh, process that uh, takes this checkpoint and runs some evaluations, some validation, because we don't want to stop our main training, but we still want to collect all these benchmarks like MMLU and other. So like we have a background process that reads every new checkpoint and tries to validate it. But it's all tricky because if our checkpoint is that big, like three terabytes, this is another process also has lots of a job to do. Just um, thinking about these gigantic checkpoints that you have and how you can even work with them. So you, you basically, the ideal scenario is you set it and forget it, but the realistic scenario is like you're going and you're trying to figure things out every once in a while on how it looks. Yeah, got it. So um, first of all, there is some sp- realize that it's important to save checkpoints properly. In a way, um, we don't need. To, so you, we save it every hour, but we don't need to store checkpoints from every hour. But we need to store I'm a checkpoint not... from yesterday and from last week. You know, kind of this exponential schedule, because you know, like if we store like it every hour, every hour is like three terabytes. We can quick, quickly reach one petabyte <laughs> of a disk. And actually, we used Kubernetes to orchestrate our training. It also was a, quite a funny and tough way to get it working, to orchestrate this 100 machines working all together. Well, because I've heard a lot of people like to use Slurm, right? Was there a reason that you chose Kubernetes instead? So, actually, no, I heard about Slurm only recently when I was talking to my colleagues who work with clients and they said like, we need Slurm because like clients use Slurm and I'm like, what's a Slurm? You know, like it happens sometimes, you have some technology that is there around like for years, but you have never touched it. And then you realize that you just needed to use right Google uh, query, search right things. Yeah, so we use Kubernetes because, I don't know, it's, it feels like natural because, I don't know, like I had experience with Kubernetes, my colleagues have experience with Kubernetes, 
yeah it's natural way to go yeah yeah i know the databricks team who trained uh dbrx they came on last week and they were talking about how they made that choice too and they went with kubernetes but i have heard a lot of the researchers enjoy slur much more than kubernetes yeah i agree so i i read a bit about slur so it seems to arise from mpi from this kind of more scientific computations and maybe the guys who are doing research they come from this background and they're used to mpi but those guys who are coming from more kind of engineering infrastructure uh, they're more familiar with kubernetes yeah yeah are there any lessons that you learned when it comes to storage choices? It was very impressive for me when I was trying to understand how does storage work in cloud. Because, you know, like if I have my laptop, it's all clear. I have my laptop, I have SSD or HSD, just save it. But in cloud, you have like data center, you have virtual machines, you have storage. Where does the storage live? If you have like, you know, like S3, and you say just S3, let's save it. What actually happens? And it turns out to be a really big, big job. Because first of all, what was mind blowing for me, you know, you have like a virtual machine and you have a disk on this virtual machine, but it's not there. It's not, if you have a virtual machine, the disk is not really connected to this machine. There are another machines that have these disks and that's why they're called um, network disks. Yeah. Cloud uses network disks, network disks, sorry, because like, you know, imagine you have a real time machine and you want, you, you want to go to another real time machine with more CPUs, with more memory, but you still have the disk. You can't just take the disk, put it into another machine. You can't move like all your data from one machine to another. That's why cloud uses this, uh, network disks and Okay, it was the first aside for me, how hard it is. And um, regarding the choice of storage, so we had several alternatives that we considered and we tried. So we had this file storage, like NFS. Yep. We had S3-like storage. And we also considered, um, so to do data preprocessing, we are using a, a product called Tractor AI. It's a product built on top of uh, what is ours. It's a kind of big data system that was previously built in Yandex. And now it's like a collaboration between Nebus and Yandex. It's like it's open source product. So we are contributing, contributing to it. And we have the structure that is built on top of this uh, what is ours. And so like we also had this option. Because when you're talking about storage, you're not just talking about these gigantic terabyte storage of checkpoints you're also talking about all the data break down everything that you're thinking about when it comes to storage i care about security and scalability because it could be that you have some storage it works just well when you attach it to one virtual machine but then like you have like 10 virtual machines and you them all want to do something but storage is not scalable and it says oh man like you had this one gigabyte of uh bandwidth but now like you all have with this one gigabyte like not not each one gigabyte but one gigabyte for all so also what's important when i'm coming to choose a storage is uh, what features does it support because you know like we all worked with uh, s3 it looks like just great it's just easy let's push something there but then when i worked with it I face this old issue that S3 is not a file system because like we, we had, uh, we tried to store checkpoints in S3 and we used uh, this kind of tools that a kind of S3 file system that make you feel that you have a bucket and a S3, but it looks like a disk. It looks like a mount and you use a machine. It worked just well, but then our checkpoints in library was doing some move like let's move the checkpoint from here to there and with s3 you can't do it because s3 is like let's copy the data and delete the old data that's how we do oh. move and it's we just observed that our 
trading became very slow. So it feels like you were hitting, it's not necessarily the scale, scaling laws that we were talking about from like the papers and the training, but you were hitting different types of scaling laws where you didn't necessarily need to think about these things. Like when you have smaller amount of data or you have smaller checkpoints, but all of a sudden S3 wasn't possible for you. So you went with, did you end up choosing NFS? So uh, at the moment we uh, use uh, this uh, tractor AI. Okay, Be- yeah. That's... Because it was an experiment and it went really well. We liked what we have. And another motivation to use tractor AI was the fact that we already use it to do data processing. We already store the data, we process the data. We know it is a reliable system. And most of the time we use the system. So it's kind of natural to use it in one more place and like have everything there. It's easier for us to manage like this. Mm-hmm. And besides storage and hitting scaling laws with storage, what are some other pieces that have become like paramount in your setup? S- yeah. First of all, it's Kubernetes. So yep. we use it a lot. Like, we have some problem. Okay, let's deploy a daemon set. We have some problem. Let's do this. Let's deploy that. It became a tool we use a lot. It's an important tool to master. And uh, we, we even use some tools on top of Kubernetes to orchestrate our trading. Yeah. Because So we use Argo. Argo is a kind of orchestration framework. And we found it really useful because... What happens with uh, model training? It's not like you just have one uh, uh, port, another port. They all connect. If you train a model on 100 machines, they all have to be coordinated. And if one machine fails, everything should fail. And so we used Argo to implement this kind of uh, coordination. Okay. It it wasn't Argo workflows then. Yeah, it was, it was... Argo workflows. Oh, it was. The interesting one about Argo workflows, I so I was just at KubeCon a few weeks ago, and it feels like everybody was wearing an Argo shirt, and it's gotten a lot of traction these days. It is what Kubeflow is built on top of. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people have gone and they said, okay, we want to get a little bit further down and have more knobs and have, I think Argo has matured nicer than Kubeflow, and so... People are going towards Argo more than Kubeflow these days, but that's that's interesting that you chose it too and you saw the value in it. What other add-ons were you using with Kubernetes? Because I know there's, especially you talked about how networking was so important. Like, were you doing special stuff with networking? Were you using a specific flavor of Kubernetes? Was it your own stood up? Was it the cloud version? What does that look like? Yeah, so we use a uh, standard uh, Kubernetes as it's available in our cloud. Uh, but we, for sure, we have some additional uh, s- stuff as we deploy to Kubernetes. First of all, it is GPU operator because GPUs are really complex. You need to monitor them well, you need to check them. So we deploy a GPU operator that's making sure that everything works work smooth. And for example, if a GPU operator checks your GPU and it sees that GPU is, I don't know, broken for some reason, it is too, I don't know, too hot, for example, it will stop it. It will just tell Kubernetes, hey, Kubernetes, this node is not good. Let's don't use it. Relax for a little bit, take a little break. Yeah. Other parts that we found useful uh, is uh, we deployed our custom uh, piece of software that runs this network testing that it, it checks that all the nodes that we're using to train are well connected, they have the right speed, just in case, you know, it can happen if you train a model, it trains all together. And if something is, if one node is slow for some reason, it looks like all training is slow. So you need, really need to have some per node monitoring to make sure that, uh, okay, this node is slow or this node is, is okay. So we do this testing to make sure that everything is well connected, works smoothly. So what are you doing in those cases? Because it's basically like 
like the army, you're only as fast as your weakest point or you're only as fast as your slowest point. And you're monitoring the Kubernetes nodes. And so let's say that one of the nodes for some reason is going very, very slow. What do you do? Do you stop training and then try and debug or you, do you go into it and try and just update on the fly? Uh, so because, you know, one great feature of cloud is you don't rent actual machines. You don't rent specific uh, GPUs. You rent kind of resource, but it's it's a concept, it's idea. So if we see that something doesn't work, and for example, this GPU is not working, we can always disable it and we will be given another. So, okay, we, we automatically stop the training. We have the process that does monitoring. It stops the training. It, this, it removes this broken GPU and we are given another node automatically and we continue there. And then we can talk to our cloud team. They will debug this, they will fix it. And later they will know what goes wrong. They will fix it. And we will not have this kind of issue like this anymore. So most of the time it's not even on your side. It's just that the GPU itself for some reason isn't working that well. Yeah, it could be the reason because you know, it's it's super hard a uh, piece of hardware. It's not like you have a machine, it has eight GPUs, they're connected, they're connected inside, they're connected to each other, they're connected to other machines. It's super hard system and there is always something that can go wrong, but because it's cloud, it's easier to just, okay, replace it and do something later. Yeah. And so you're monitoring the system and the Kubernetes clusters, I imagine. Uh, are you using something like a Prometheus on that? And then you're also monitoring the training. And are there other things that you're monitoring? Yeah, sure. So um, first of all, uh, we use one weights and biases to collect our um, like training clocks, I mean like loss and etc. And when the biases already does a pretty good job, it co also collects some um, statistics about the real-time machine. It shows some GPU, temperature, I don't know, like the amount of memory consumed. So we have quite a lot of information coming from weights and biases. Uh, also, there are lots of cloud-based monitorings. So because when you create a real-time machine in cloud, it already has some monitorings in it. We just go to another tab in UI and we see the temperature, I don't know, we see CPU load, etc. Also, we collect logs of training and it became also quite a challenging um, task because it's no like it's interesting how machine learning is getting closer to kind of microservices because I used to do microservices before and I used some logging systems with microservices and uh, it's all distributed but they're connected. It's the same about training. You have a training, it's running on 100 machines but it's all interconnected and you need to collect logs from every machine uh, to eventually have a picture of what went wrong because if training fails just every node, every machine has a bunch of logs of logs like hey something went wrong I'm failed I'm failed I'm failed I'm failed and you need to have a way to find this one specific uh, machine that had a real error because others failed because that one failed yeah because it's all linked so if one goes down everyone goes down yeah so that it's it's funny you mentioned that because I do remember there was this blog post that came out I want to say it was like 2020 or early 2021 from OpenAI and they talked about how they scaled their Kubernetes cluster to over 6,000 nodes and I remember when that came out and this was pre OpenAI being you know what it is today and I was so fascinated by that by how big of training jobs they needed and the type of problems that they were looking at. And so this was as they were probably training like GPT-2 and they were scaling it up to 6,000 nodes and getting to that point um, 
So I, I understand things can get very complex and very quickly. And so you're looking at the training job. So you're monitoring the training job. You're also monitoring the GPUs, making sure they're working and then making sure that you have a way to debug if things go offline. And then you're also monitoring just the system in general and the Kubernetes cluster, making sure that that is working and there's every node is firing how it should. Yeah, exactly. So we try to monitor everything. So I, there's two last questions that I want to get to for you. First one is around pre-training versus fine tuning and how much of like this conversation that we're having with checkpoints changes as we start looking at fine tuning i guess the difference is uh, first of all if you do fine tuning you don't need so many gpus if you do pre-training you need to have like thousand gpus but if you then want to fine tune this model you have just i don't know like one thousand of uh, rows of data five thousands i don't know not not many not billions of rows and you don't need so many GPUs, you're okay to go with just two machines. But the problem is the model is still as big as it was. It was like three terabytes, it is still three terabytes. But now you need to fit this three terabytes, not into 100 machines, into two machines or four machines. You need to load the three terabytes from two machines and it creates a different kind of uh, workload for the cloud different kinds of requirements because you know like if you want to load a checkpoint from 100 machines you want your storage to be scalable in terms of consumers you want your storage to be able to work with 100 clients at the same time but now you don't need so many you don't have so many consumers you just want to load the three terabytes from two machines but now you need this network to be super fast Wow. This 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 particular network from storage to this one machine to be super fast. Otherwise, you will wait, I don't know, like one hour waiting for your data to get into your machine. But weren't you saying that the networking that you need for pre-training is also, it needs to be super fast or there you can have it be a little less? So when we do pre-training, uh, because we have, uh, many machines and we kind of split our checkpoints uh, so in a way that as I mentioned uh, every machine is loading and saving only a small part of checkpoint it's saving like 30 gigabytes out of 3 terabytes so for every particular machine you don't need to save and load so much data you just need to make sure that it works it works and like if you have some good okay uh, speed of the network you will finish it but now you have all the same amount of data that you need to read from one host and that's like 100 more data that need to be transferred over the same network but over one network channel uh -huh. and it's kind of different design from the storage perspective from the networking perspective and it's funny also network it's it's interesting how, how complex networking is because I remember when I was doing some experiments and then network guys from network are coming to me and say, hey, what are you doing? Like, we see our main torings just exploded. And I'm saying, oh, well, I'm testing this. And they like, okay, let us tune our network so that it will uh, be able to scale better to do the thing. And they ask me different questions like, how does your network work? Do we go like from here to there or from here to there? Because these are different layers of network and they require different parts of the network to work. I'm like, I don't know, let's discuss. That is fascinating. Networking is a, an art, 100%. You, you got to a point where you were like, all right, well, we can get some optimization here if I meet with the networking team and I see how our training or and this was in the training or this was in the fine tuning phase it was in training when we were trying to load a checkpoint from 100 machines you know, it's a big load right at the same time the same moment so it was that moment good stress test yeah for the networking team yeah 
Uh, yeah, I'm sure the first person to catch that was just like, what is going on here? Who is doing... What are, what are people doing here? We got to go talk to Simon. <laughs> yeah, it was exactly the, the thing. And I was lucky because one of the colleagues who are doing network, uh, she's sitting in my office, like oh, right nice. near me. So she came to me and said like, hey, what are we doing? <laughs> uh, yeah, we got to have a conversation. Come to my... Come to my... Uh... <laughs> office that's that's great so that's the differences big differences that we need to keep in mind when it comes to fine-tuning versus pre-training what about when it comes to like the traditional ml training with a scikit learn model versus now when you're training llms we've gone over how wildly different it is when it comes to checkpoints and sizes but are there things that you want to highlight that you keep in mind now or that you learned from making that jump from like traditional ML and working with scikit-learn and then going into like more deep learning and LLMs. Maybe the first lesson I have is unless you're good with scikit-learn, you don't need PyTorch. Unless you're good with PyTorch, you don't need like super fancy deep learning models on uh, eight GPUs yeah. because it's not like, okay, let's just use GPU. I feel it's like a much bigger shift of complexity that you get. So unless you're good with some, some, something simpler, I believe you should use something simpler. Yeah. Only then shift to something bigger. But it's interesting how it happened with large language models because um, I talked to my friend and he told like, you know, previously we had some problem, but we didn't have data and we couldn't do anything. But with large language models, we can have zero data, but we can still solve the problem. Yeah. In a way that now many problems that he used to solve with scikit-learn could be solved just with uh, prompting of ChatGPT, maybe. Yeah. But it requires some extra complexity from the GPT side. So what you're saying is like, there were use cases that we wanted to tackle, but we didn't have the data for. And now we don't need the data because it's already in the model and we can just go and prompt it. Yeah, it's like super impressive how it changed because it technology that wasn't there like a year ago, two years ago, it came and it changed everything. But I do like this notion of keep it simple. It is so funny that we need to keep repeating it because it's so easy to overcomplicate and want to jump to calling ourselves. <laughs> like, it's just like we get to wear these medals of, all right, yeah, I've trained a, a model that is, I used a thousand GPUs to train this model or whatever it is, you know, bigger is better type thing. But if you don't need to, then why? Why do you do it, right? Yeah. But, you know, like... I guess just some people like to do cool things. So they like to do hard things. And this is what motivates them to, to work. This is the driver. Okay, they can do it simple, but they don't like it. But they, they can do it complex and they enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, dude, this has been super fun to talk with you. I appreciate this. You gave me a sobering look at what it takes to actually train these models and you are encountering some of the challenges like day in and day out and i appreciate you sharing these challenges with us because now hopefully anybody out there that wants to do this knows what it takes yeah it's really thank you Hold up, wait a minute, we gotta talk real fast because I am so excited about the MLOps Community Conference that is happening on June 25th in San Francisco. It is our first in-person conference ever. Honestly, I'm shaking in my boots because it's something that I've wanted to do for ages. We've been doing the online version of this and hopefully I've gained enough of your trust for you to be able to say that I know when this guy has a conference, it's going to be quality. Funny enough, we are doing it. The whole theme is about AI quality. I teamed up with my buddy Mo at Colena, who knows a thing or two about AI quality. And we are going to have some of the most impressive speakers that you could think of. 
I'm not going to list them all here because it would probably take the next two to five minutes. But just know, we've got the CTO of Cruise coming to give a little keynote. We've got the CEO of U.com coming. We've got Chip. We've got Linus. We've got the whole crew that you would expect. And I am going to be doing all kinds of extracurricular activities that will be fun and maybe a little bit cringe. You, you may see, hear or see me playing the guitar. Just come. It's going to be an awesome time. We'd love to have you there. And that is, again, June 25th in San Francisco. See you all then. Yeah.